Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, I welcome all of you to my today's discussion. Uh, we'll uh, today talk about T.S. Eliot's conception of tradition, which he <clears throat> propounded in his most influential essay, Tradition and Individual Talent, uh, that was published in 1919. In this essay, T.S. Eliot attempted two things to do. First, he has redefined the term tradition and put a new breath into it. Secondly, he has come up with a new poetic theory in reaction to the romantic poets. Uh, and this poetic theory is known as theory of impersonality. It means that poem should be impersonal, separate from the personality of the poet. However, our today's discussion will be focused on the concept of tradition. Tradition is the word or the concept which the English had almost no notion about. In English mind, there is no notion of literary tradition. Or tradition uh, was just a negative word. Tradition had it always a negative connotation. When we say that the poet is too traditional, or when we say that the poet is traditional, we actually express our uh, state of disapproval for the poet. But T.S. Eliot has done uh, a, almost a revolutionary thing to change and redefine the dimension of tradition and a new meaning he has infused into it. Uh, quite revolutionary, quite in a revolutionary manner, T.S. Eliot says that no poem can be an original poet, no poet can be an original poet without being traditional. That means to be an original poet, one should be traditional. And he also says that the best part of a poet's work must be found in those where the dead poets have asserted their immortality. The dead poets have asserted their greatness. In this way, T.S. Eliot has made the word tradition almost totally a new one. However, in the essay, Tradition in, in, and Individual Talent, T.S. Eliot has showed uh, several dimensions of tradition. For our students' sake, I want to discuss Eliot's concept of tradition uh, by dividing it into four points. First, tradition is a historical sense for Eliot. By historical sense, Eliot means that uh, a perception of not only pastness of the past, but of its present. That means past does not end in the past. It continues to affect the present. To put it simply, uh, we can say that by using obviously Eliot's formulation that the past is altered by the present as much as the present is directed by the past. To put it simply, uh, we can say that historical sense is actually uh, an understanding of the relationship between the past and the present. And uh, this relationship between past and the present is not one-sided at all. The past continues to affect the present and the present also alters the past. <clears throat> According to Eliot, a poet must develop a sense and awareness of the past and he must continue to develop it throughout his poetic career. It is very important for T.S. Eliot to achieve historical sense and he says that historical sense cannot be inherited. It must be obtained 
by arduous labor, by great effort. It cannot be handed out to the succeeding generations. It has to be achieved through laborious process and study. This is one aspect of historical sense. Another aspect of historical sense is that historical sense is a perception of the timeless and the temporal and their togetherness. Timeless and temporal and of timelessness and temporality together. It is another dimension of historical sense according to T.S. Eliot. So now I have already discussed the first dimension of tradition that it is a historical sense. Now second, tradition denotes the relationship between the dead poets and the living ones, the old poets and the new ones. Uh, no poet can be meaningful in isolation. Poets must be just against each other. T.S. Eliot says that a poet must be put into compare and contrast with other poets. He uh, also asserts that the poets must be judged by the canon of the past. But this judgment is simply a judgment actually. It is not an amputation. That means it's not a clinical operation to cut off one another. It is just a comparison. It is a judgment. judgment and it is, it is uh, a type of measuring each other. However, uh, it is another dimension of tradition that tradition is a relationship between the living poets and the dead ones. Now, we'll turn up to the third dimension of tradition. For T.S. Eliot, tradition uh, is an order, is an impersonal order, is an ideal order. Existing literary pieces, which, uh, which T.S. Eliot called uh, existing monuments, T.S. Eliot argues existing monuments forms an ideal order. And this monument is modified, this monument is changed sometimes by the introduction of a new work. And this uh, existing monument or this existing order is complete, Eliot says, until a new work comes up on the stage. And the new work, really new work, sometimes alters the whole of the order. And then uh, within the order, each particular work is readjusted within the wholeness of the order. For instance, we can say that by using our own example, that Rabindranath Tagore and Nozul Islam form an order. When Jivananda Dash comes to the stage, then the order is changed. The order is shifted and the meaning of Rabindra Tagore and the meaning of Nuzdul uh, was newly produced in comparison with Jibananda Dash. That means Jibananda Dash alters the present though Jibananda Dash could never appear as a poet if there was no Rabindra Tagore and Nuzdul. Thus, tradition is an order. A new poet arrives on the stage. He adds something to the order, existing order, and a new order is created. Thus, tradition is an ideal order for T.S. Eliot. Uh, our fourth point is that Tradition has a temporal dimension. 
T.S. Eliot asserts that uh, a poet must understand, a poet must feel that the whole of European literature and the whole of English literature has a simultaneous existence. They form a simultaneous order. And within this order, a poet, a new English poet will have to function. That means a poet has to be rooted in his country and in the place what the country is a part of, in the continent what the country is a part of. To put it simply, you can say that an English poet will have to be both an English and a European. We can also alter the example and use our own one that uh, we'll be Asian. We'll, we'll have to get ourselves acquainted with Asian values and Asian poetry. If we want to write Bengali poetry, we must know the tradition of Bengali poetry and alongside knowing our literature of our own country, we'll have to know the literature of the continent, Asian continent. Thus, Eliot also attaches another dimension of tradition that tradition has a spatial dimension. Spatial means S-P-A-T-I-L. Spatial spelling is S-P-A-T-I-L. So, we have already contrived four characteristics of tradition. I want to remind you that first, tradition means a historical sense. Second, tradition refers to the relationship between the living and the dead poets uh, and the new and the old ones. Third number, tradition is an impersonal order. Fourth, tradition uh, is a spatial dimension. That means a poet have to be, a poet has to be rooted in his country and in his continent. Now, T.S. Eliot uh, enunciates his point in this manner that a poet must surrender himself to the impersonal order of tradition. That means if any poet wants to write poetry, if any poet wants to write poems, he'll have to surrender his personality to tradition because tradition is more valuable than the expression of one's personality. And T.S. Eliot will define uh, poetry in this manner that poetry is not an uh, expression of personality, rather an escape from it. In our next lecture, we'll discuss Eliot's theory of impersonality and uh, the self-sacrifice of the poet to the altar of tradition. So long, you will keep fine. Uh, thanks for watching.